boys and girls, it's time for another week of music, yay! If you remember last week, we started learning all about a famous orchestral piece of music called Peter and the Wolf. Last week, we met two of the characters, Peter and the bird. I hope you remember what instruments we used to represent Peter and to represent the bird in the song. But just in case you don't remember, we're going to listen to their themes one more time, and then we'll talk about it again after. So turn on your listening ears and get ready. Did those sound familiar? I hope you remembered them from last week. So if you remember, last week we learned about Peter and he was represented by the violin. Remember, the stringed instrument that is used a bow to make the sound. And then the bird was represented by what instrument? The flute, that's right. It's a long woodwind instrument that uses keys to change the notes. Well, today we're going to learn about two more characters in Peter and the Wolf. We're going to meet the cat and we're going to meet the duck. Just like Peter and the bird, they're also represented by their own instruments and their own theme. Now, if you remember from last week, we talked about what a theme is. A theme is one piece of music that is played over and over again to represent something. In this case, they represent different characters. So let's listen to the cat's theme. Now the cat is represented by the clarinet and we're gonna learn all about the clarinet after we listen to the theme. I'm gonna put the lyrics up that go with the cat as well so you can read along with them or have your teacher read to you and listen to the music. Enjoy. Did that sound like a cat slinking around being all sneaky and stealthy to you? Well, that's what it was supposed to represent. This time, we're gonna listen to it again, and I want you to pretend to be cats, and I want you to slink around the room like you're a cat prowling after some prey. Have fun. <laughs> So now that you're familiar with what the cat's theme sounds like, let's learn a little bit about the instrument that makes that theme. It's called the clarinet. Um, the clarinet is basically just a cylindrical uh, wooden tube uh, with finger holes so that as I take more fingers off the instrument, uh, the pitch will rise. <laughs> like that. 
and a lot of met metal keys in order to enable me to play all the notes in between those notes, the chromatic notes. <laughs> And some of that metal work is to enable us to play trills, for example, quite rapidly and efficiently. Now, if I didn't have the key on the side of the instrument, that trill would come out like this. Which might not particularly please either the conductor or the composer. So, a lot of this metal stuff, although it looks complicated, is actually there to simplify matters for us. In order that we don't have to carry uh, a case around which is as long as this instrument, particularly as we usually have to carry two, the instrument takes apart. Um, and you can see there is the bell, which is the end of the clarinet, called a bell because it's bell shaped, obviously. You then have the main part of the clarinet in a lower joint and an upper joint. And then at the very top, we have a barrel and the mouthpiece and reed on the mouthpiece, which go on the top of the barrel. Well, if you go to an orchestral concert, you may have sometimes wondered why you see the clarinetists uh, with two clarinets, whereas all the other members of the woodwind section have just the one. Um, and you'll some, sometimes see us change quite rapidly from one to the other. Now, this isn't because one of the instruments has suddenly become worn out, or indeed that we're trying out different instruments in the concert. Um, it's just that because of the nature of the fingering system on the clarinet, uh, most composers write for two different clarinets in order to avoid us playing in complicated keys. So we have a B-flat clarinet, which is the shorter one, and an A clarinet, which is the longer one. Uh, I'll just put a mouthpiece on so that you can hear the difference in pitch. So if I finger the note C on my B-flat clarinet, it comes out as a B-flat. And if I finger the same note C on my A clarinet, it comes out as an A. Sometimes in a concert you may see clarinetists adjust their instrument at the barrel by slightly pulling out or pushing in to adjust the length of the instrument. This is because we may have noticed that either one or two of our colleagues or possibly ourselves or somewhere else in the orchestra something has slightly changed in pitch and we need to microscopically change the pitch of the instrument in order to adjust that so that the sound reaches the audience bang in tune. Now, the reed, which is a quite simple piece of wood, you see at one end it's a piece of cane, which has been cut so it tapers to a very, very thin tip, so thin I can even put it on my thumbnail and it will show flexibility. So the very end of the reed is very flexible. It means that when I put the reed against the mouthpiece, there's a small gap to blow air down, but small enough that when that air goes through the instrument, the tip of the reed will vibrate, and that's what makes the sound. Yeah. Um, the way we produce the sound, obviously, uh, to get a basic sound, one blows through the instrument as warmly as possible. Now, if I blow the air through the instrument far more slowly, the sound will become softer. And if I blow the air through the instrument very fast, you'll get a louder sound. Now, uh, I've played so far just long notes. If we want to play a series of separate notes... And you see, I blew down the instrument several times separately then. But that sounds rather breathless and unmusical. So what we do is to use the tip of the tongue against the reed to stop the sound, interrupt the sound, uh, which will enable us to keep the air going and play a number of repeated notes more musically. <laughs> And one can, by using that method, play extremely short. 
uh, there's a passage in Beethoven's Fourth Symphony where he asks the bassoonist and the clarinetist to play a very, very rapid staccato. <laughs> Uh, which can be a nightmare in a concert if it doesn't go quite right. Of course, not if it does. Um, so that's an example of quite fast tonguing, and there's a separate t tongue stroke for every one of those notes. <laughs> Now you know all about how a clarinet works. There's a lot of different pieces to it and a lot of different keys that you can use to create different notes. Let's listen to the cat's theme one more time and we're going to pretend to play our clarinet along with the theme. Have fun. Now it's time to learn about the duck. So the duck in Peter and the Wolf is represented by an oboe. An oboe and a clarinet sound very similar and they're played in very similar ways, but we are gonna learn about the differences between the two. Before we do that though, let's listen to the theme. And this time I want you to waddle around your classroom like a duck while it's playing. Just like last time, I'm going to put the lyrics up while it plays so your teacher can read them to you or you can read them yourself so you get a better idea of what the duck is supposed to be doing. Okay, spread out and get ready to waddle. Now that we're familiar with what the duck's theme sounds like, let's learn about the instrument that makes that music, called an oboe. The oboe comes apart into three sections, like this. We have what's called the top joint and the middle joint and the bell and they fit back together the metal work has to be very carefully aligned because it's quite delicate the modern oboe has approximately 46 pieces of keywork the functions of which vary from simply covering the main tone holes these six keys here to uh, trill keys and also these keys on the back which your thumb operates to help you um, play into the higher octaves to make a sound on the oboe you have to place the reed on your lower lip and roll your lips over your teeth and blow Because the opening at the top of the reed is very small, the oboe demands a lot of pressure and it's quite hard work. Um, it helps to start notes using the tongue, like this. Sometimes in oboe writing, the music is written slurred or legato, which means no tonguing in between the notes. Because the pressure involved in playing the oboe is quite high, it takes time to build up the stamina in order to play 
long phrases that sometimes composers demand of the instrument. The sound of the oboe can be made more expressive by the use of vibrato. Vibrato is produced using a combination of the diaphragm, which is a muscle at the base of your rib cage, and also controlling it using muscles in your throat. I'll play a note starting without any vibrato and then I'll add vibrato. Playing both very quietly and very loudly on the oboe is quite difficult. It's all controlled by the muscles in your tummy, your diaphragm, just below the rib cage. So to play quietly you have to almost use more air and more support than if you were playing loudly. I'll try now. And to play loudly on the oboe, you have to open everything up, really support with your diaphragm, open your throat and go for it. See, I told you the clarinet and the oboe are very similar instruments. They're both held the same way. They both use a reed. Well, the oboe has a double reed, right? That's the difference. And they have slightly different sounds. But the fingerings are very similar and they're played in very similar ways. Now that we know all about how to play the oboe, let's get out our pretend oboes and listen to the duck's theme one more time. And I'd like you to play along with it. Here we go. My friends, I hope you had fun learning about two more characters in Peter and the Wolf. Next week, we're going to continue and learn about a couple more and introduce some more instruments that we find in the orchestra. For now, I want you to think about the instruments that we've learned about, the violin, the flute, the clarinet, and the oboe. And take a minute and talk in your class about some of the similarities and differences between all of those instruments. You can also talk about what themes you liked the best, which ones you didn't find so interesting, and which ones you think were most important in the story. I'll see you next time.